Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be thinking about the internal forces that stop a planet from collapsing under gravity and more specifically we're going to be finding the pressure of the force per unit area inside a spherical planet as a function of radial distance from the centre. We're going to say that the planet has a radius of capital R and we're going to assume that it has a uniform density rho. Now the assumption of uniform density is of course not quite correct for a planet like the Earth, which has this layered structure, but we can still get a sort of order of magnitude estimate of the pressure at various different distances, and the method that we're going to discuss can be generalized quite easily to uh, non-uniform densities if you know the density as a function of radial distance. Now part of the definition of a planet is that it's an object that's so massive that its shape has become rounded because of its own self-gravity. The idea there is that even if a planet is made of a material that we would usually describe as being a solid, like rock for example, if you subject that material to a very large force such as self-gravity over a very long time scale it will behave like a fluid on those long time scales in the sense that it can change its shape and will eventually settle down into a sphere if the force uh, that's deforming it is large enough. A nice way of summarizing that is to say that the planet has reached hydrostatic equilibrium and mathematically hydrostatic equilibrium means that the internal pressure gradient forces uh, so grad p are just right to balance the uh, gravitational force acting on each little element of the planet. So grad p equals rho g, and if you'd like to see a formal full derivation of that, have a look at my last video. So if we take this hydrostatic equilibrium condition as our starting point, as long as we know g as a function of radial distance r, then we have a differential equation for the pressure that we will be able to solve. So let's start by figuring out what the gravitational field is. So first of all, by symmetry, we have a sphere, and therefore the gravitational field vector must be pointing in the radial direction, in other words, in the direction of the r hat vector in spherical coordinates. So we can say that the g vector is just a scalar which you can call g without an arrow on top of it, multiplied by r hat. But how can we figure out what this scalar g is? Well, we can use Gauss's law for gravity, which says that the surface integral of the gravitational field is minus 4 pi g times the mass enclosed within the surface that you integrated over. So let's choose the most convenient surface to integrate over, which is just a sphere of radius lowercase r. In that case, our surface integral is just going to be 4 pi r squared multiplied by g because the gravitational field is constant on that um, sphere by symmetry. And then the right-hand side of Gauss's law is just going to be minus 4 pi g times, let's call it m, subscript enc, so the enclosed mass within the sphere. Then, of course, the 4 pi's cancel, and you conclude that g is minus uh, big g times m enclosed divided by r squared. Uh, the minus sign there just reflects the fact that gravity is attractive, so the gravitational field vector is always sort of pulling inwards. And also note that this looks like an inverse square law, but it's not really because m enclosed itself also depends on the radius. So now let's combine that with our original hydrostatic equilibrium condition. First of all, how are we going to deal with this grad p thing? Well, by symmetry, note that p doesn't depend on theta or phi in spherical coordinates. It only depends on the radial coordinate r. And therefore, grad p can just be written as dp by dr multiplied by the r hat vector. On the right hand side of the equation, we're still going to have our rho, but then we're going to have this thing here multiplied by the r hat vector as well. And so let's write that as minus g over r squared. What are we going to do about the m enclosed? Well, the mass enclosed within that spherical surface that we integrated over is just going to be the volume of the corresponding sphere multiplied by the density. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds of pi r cubed. Then I multiply that by the density to convert it into a mass, and then we put the r hat vector on the end. Then of course we can just ignore the r hat vectors because they appear on both sides, as of course they have to, and simplify everything to get dp by dr is minus 4 pi g rho squared uh, divided by 3, and then multiplied by r. Now all we have to do is integrate to undo the derivative on the left hand side. So the pressure is just going to be the integral of that stuff minus 4 pi g rho squared over 3r um, with respect to r. And we just use the power law. That's pretty easy to integrate. You're going to uh, change your r into an r squared over 2 and get minus 2 pi g rho squared over 3 r squared plus some constant c that we have to determine. So to determine c we of course need some boundary condition. Where is that going to come from? Well think about the physical origin of the pressure. The pressure exists purely because 
the gravitational force is trying to make the planet contract. So the deeper you go into the planet, the more pressure you're going to be experiencing because you've got all of the material on top of you sort of pushing down. So by that logic, the pressure at the surface of the planet, when the radial coordinate is equal to the radius of the planet, capital R, the pressure should be zero because there's no material pushing down on you when you're at the surface of the planet. Here we're sort of pretending either that the planet doesn't have an atmosphere or that the atmospheric pressure is negligible. But in any case, mathematically, that would be expressed as P evaluated at capital R is equal to zero. So you're going to set all of that stuff that I've just circled to zero when small r equals big R. Um, and then you reach the conclusion that C is just positive 2 pi g rho squared over 3 times capital R squared. And then you can put it all together to find the pressure as a function of arbitrary distance. Um, you're just going to have um, those two terms combined. And we could factor out that pre-factor of 2 pi g rho squared divided by 3. Then you're just going to have big R squared minus small r squared. One thing you could immediately do with this is plug in the mean density of the Earth and the radius of the Earth and set uh, small r to zero to estimate the pressure at the center of the earth. If you do that, you get to one significant figure, um, about 200 gigapascals. Now that's of course not perfect, but it's actually pretty decent. The order of magnitude is correct if you compare that with other values of the pressure at the center of the earth that you will find around. If you wanted to refine this model a little bit, all you would have to do is go back to the stage where we integrated and this rho squared here, instead of treating that as a constant, you would just put in rho as a function of r if you know how it depends on r and then do the resulting integral either analytically or numerically. Okay, I think we're done here. So thank you for watching and see you next time.